so let's talk about the fundamental particles and what you can do with them when you go to quantum to use uh, to use them in a quantum computer or to use them to compute quantumly. No, what's the best way of phrasing that? Well, so so. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a quantum mechanical engineer. I'm a professor of quantum mechanical engineering at MIT. I'm really kind of a quantum mechanic, you might say. You know, your quantum are broke. We fix them for a high price, by the way. You know, <laughs> it's a, it's hard to, well, it's easy to break quantum, but it's hard to put them back together again. So it justifies our high rates. Um, so I spend my time with my colleagues building quantum computers, which are computers that store bits of information on individual atoms. And so maybe. At some level, this is actually not so hard because nature is at bottom digital. The, indeed, the quantum in quantum mechanics means that the bottom things are chunky. They come in chunks. And the ordinary computers work by taking information and turning them into little chunks that we call bits. You know, bit is just the distinction between, well, it's often called zero or one, or yes or no, or true or false, heads or tails, or a little switch open, or a little switch closed. Or that's how it, uh, a bit is stored in a computer. Or in your hard drive or your iPod, uh, a little magnet with the North Pole pointing up, call that zero. Little magnet with the North Pole pointing down, call that one. So ordinary computers work by digitizing information, making it discrete, busting it up into the smallest chunks called bits. Now, what quantum mechanics tells us about nature is that nature is at bottom discrete. It's got this chunky quality to it. So for instance, in an atom, the let's take a hydrogen atom with one electron rotating around one proton. The states of that electron are discrete, so they're chunky. Energy comes in chunks, so the lowest energy state, the electrons over here snuggled up against the proton, against the nucleus. And then the next discrete energy state is over there. It's, um, it's in a higher energy state further away from the nucleus. So you can call this lowest discrete state zero, the next highest state one. The electron in the hydrogen atom is essentially digital and can store a bit of information. So that's kind of nice because it actually means that, um, that uh, this digital quality of the way that atoms behave allows us to map bits of information onto atoms. One atom, one bit as our Supreme Court in the United States said. No, it was one man, one vote. That's what it was. Anyway, they'll soon be changing now, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> one bush, one vote. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, one buck, one vote, as I yeah. phrase more what it normally is. Uh, so, so we can map bits of information on individual atoms. And in fact, if you take, say, a molecule made up of a bunch of atoms, each atom can store a bit of information. And uh, these atoms are inside a molecule. One angstrom apart, one ten billionth of a meter apart. They're interacting with each other. And if you understand their interactions, if you listen to what they have to say carefully, you can kind of massage their ordinary interactions in ways to make them flip bits. And flipping a bit is just electron goes from over here, zero, to over there, one, right? So just move the electron from here to there. You can flip the bit. Or you can do copying operations or little logical operations, like take the and of two bits, the or of two bits. And if you can put together logical operations, then you can compute. And indeed, a digital computer, all that it's doing is, at bottom, taking these bits of information and flipping these bits in a controlled fashion. So you're doing and operations and nots and copies and? Absolutely. And on ordinary computer, in fact, if there's a famous theorem due to George Boole, dates back to the 1820s or so, says if you can do AND operations, OR operations, NOT operations, copy operations. Actually, in fact, if you can do AND operations, OR operations, and no operate, NOT operations, and copy operations, you can do anything a digital computer can do. So in fact, all digital computer, an ordinary computer like a Mac or a PC, all it's doing is doing simple, long sequences of simple logical operations on bits. And we can do that with atoms. You know, just zap them with lasers, talk to them in the right way, you can make the atoms compute. And so you use the essentially digital uh, nature of nature, <laughs> comes from quantum mechanics, and you can make a molecule compute. And you know, I realized that this was possible. The idea that somehow you could compute in this funny quantum mechanical regime was proposed by Richard Feynman and Paul Benioff back in the early 80s. But nobody had a clue how to do it. And about in the early 90s, 
I figured out that with off-the-shelf components, you know, atoms, molecules, and lasers and microwave generators, you could take those atoms, zap them with lasers, and use their natural interactions to make them compute. And we've been happily doing this ever since. Every once in a while, it would get, I would just when I was going, oh my god, I can't take something else, you, you lighten it up and, and make me laugh, and usually in a way that, that kind of clicks in the piece of information. That's a real gift. I think. Yeah, well, if I can make somebody laugh at the second law of thermodynamics, well, hey. <laughs> uh, Lenny Bruce has nothing on me. <laughs> oh, it's a, really, it's a fascinating book and, and entertaining, too. Nicely done. Thank you very much, Craig. The book is Programming the Universe, A Quantum Computer Scientist Takes on the Cosmos. I've been speaking with the author Seth Lloyd, inventor of the quantum, first ever quantum computer. Well, I showed people how to build them, and then we made them. I like it. And Programming the Universe, published by Knopf.